Hey everyone, welcome back to OTD Canadian Military History. Sorry about the delay there. Uh, we're having uh, just a few uh, few hiccups, but we're good to go. So we're all here and ready to go. So today, uh, I'm excited to do uh, today's live stream about something a little different, introducing kind of a project. I don't think I've ever had anyone on to do something like this. So it's it's good, and it's good to have some outreach and work with some other people and, and get their message out there and what they're trying to do. I'll let today's guest do all the actual technical details and everything like that. But uh, so excited to have uh, Joseph Quinn on from uh, their Finest Hour project. Um, hopefully I don't explain it incorrectly, but basically an initiative to collect stories, documents, everything digitally to have access. Um, and I don't want to give too much away because I'm going to let, uh, let Joseph talk about everything and, uh, and we'll go from there. And if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to drop them in the chat, but, uh, and we'll get to them, uh, when we can, just, there's going to be a lot, uh, lots of, uh, uh, details and things like that as we, as we move along. So thanks for, uh, for coming on the channel. I appreciate it having you on and uh, sorry, I had to, heard you had some trouble with the room, but we're good to go. So that's, uh, that's good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very delighted to be here. That's great. So um, as we're just quickly chatting um, and as my uh, regular viewers know, I like to talk to who's ever on kind of why they do what they do, but this is a group um, project, an initiative for a lot of people. So I was just wondering if you can kind of give us, the background of how this project came about? Well, this project is really the legacy of um, a series of digital humanities projects that have been run um, specifically uh, by the English faculty at Oxford University. Um, in particular, our project lead, Dr. Stuart Lee, has been the pioneer of what we call the Oxford Community Collections Model. Now, what this is, is really, this is a, a modern version of something that Oxford have been doing for quite a long time, which is crowdsourcing. Um, we can trace crowdsourcing, the history behind crowdsourcing really goes back, it, it, goes, it goes back for many, many decades, possibly even centuries. And um, Oxford were by no means the first organization to do this, but they probably were the first organization to do it in a mass organized scale hmm. um, for a... Uh, for a collective uh, project which had a definitive outcome. And what I'm referring to specifically is the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary, which was mm -hmm. one of the first modern um, dictionaries which itemized um, the full, um, shall we say, uh, range of the English language. And the methods that were used were basically um, to, to submit um, by um, just simple um, scripted notes uh, the origins of particular words in the English language, and including words that came in from other languages as well. And these were all submitted. Their provenance was recorded and um, you know, their linguistic origins was, was noted, whether it be through French, Latin um, and um, Anglo-Saxon. And these words were basically submitted in, they were submitted in and they were recorded by the staff members who worked um, under the direction of the director of research, basically, for compiling the Oxford English Dictionary. So really, there's a long legacy behind crowdsourcing. In the modern era, crowdsourcing is used widely to essentially to assemble archives, uh, right. particularly from members of the general public. And in the case of this particular project, our big precursor project was what was known as Less We Forget, which in, for the context of this conversation was a First World War based project, um, which was really, um, it, it was designed to crowdsource the public heritage around the First World War. Right. And in addition to the project being run in the UK under the masthead, lest we forget, there was also a compatriot project run on the continent of Europe throughout uh, European countries, including the Republic of Ireland, and it was known as Europeana 1914-18, which use the same model, the Oxford Community Collections model, to crowdsource public heritage around the Second World War. And they gathered over 400,000 items mm -hmm. um, to their particular collection. So it was one of the lar largest crowdsourcing endeavors um, ever attempted. And um, so really what we're looking to do with, Le with their finest hour, um, you're probably noting <laughs> the uh, origins of this particular um, phrase from uh, Winston Spencer Churchill, the w legendary wartime prime minister of the United Kingdom. Mm. Uh, the, um, the whole purpose of this project and really the whole theme of this project is 
to look at the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth and to look at the war effort that was rendered by the people who partook in the Second World War in any capacity, whether it being the armed forces, whether it being the auxiliary services, or whether it being on the land, in the factories, in uh, the emergency services, or in any voluntary capacity where the Allied war effort was supported. And it's also inclusive of the United States war effort and mm -hmm. also combined Allied war efforts from any particular quarter. And we even have an interest in the war effort and the experiences of people in enemy countries as well, and mm -hmm. i.e. Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and also Imperial Japan. This is a very wide-ranging project, and really what we're saying to people is that the greatest archive that exists for Second World War heritage is actually the archive that's owned by the people themselves. Mm -hmm. It is what you have in your attic or your loft. It is the picture of your grandmother who was in the Women's Land Army or your grandfather who landed on Sword Beach during D-Day while serving with the Royal Ulster Rifles, or it is your uh, great uncle who served in the Royal Air Force and Bomber Command. It is, or, or could be, you know, your father who was an evacuee from the East End of London who was sent to some far-flung place like Cornwall. It's really any memory or any reminiscence or any object. We have a particular emphasis on objects, uh, documents, artifacts, various different things like that with a story attached. And we ask you to submit it through our online archive or to come to one of our digital collection days. And there's over a hundred of these going to be held throughout the United Kingdom and bring this item or just bring your story or your memory and have us record it for posterity before these memories are lost and before the stories behind these artifacts and objects are lost or before the objects or artifacts are lost themselves. Right, so just uh, just a quick jump in there. Uh, I've linked um, a website, uh, the YouTube channel and Twitter. So there's lots of ways to get uh, in touch on find this information for everyone watching and for watching afterwards. Um, so and I'm gonna add some more um, depending on uh, what I can find. And I notice you guys have other social media channels as well. So I'm gonna cover every base as possible because like I already said, I think this is an amazing idea and I wanna help as much as possible and get as many people involved. Um, I just wanna go back to what you were talking there about the actual events themselves. Cause I think you mentioned one that is coming up already. Yes, um, our first major event is going to be held at Oxfordshire County Library. Uh, so m most most counties um, throughout the United Kingdom have um, a main public library. Um, th there's also local public libraries in villages, towns, and, and so on and so forth. But there is a central uh, county library or central public li library in every major uh, county and borough of the United Kingdom. And so Oxfordshire County Library is the main central library for the county of Oxfordshire and it's a reference library and um, essentially it's a very large facility and we are holding our first uh, major event in the United Kingdom um, to effectively commence the project. And this will be the first of at least 15 to 20 major events that will be held at major locations, major national institutions right across the country that will include the national museums and libraries of the constituent nations of the united kingdom england scotland sorry scotland wales and northern ireland uh, as well as major regional and public libraries archives and um, institutions throughout england um, and it will really will have a regional focus and supported by that are hundreds of uh, well, we're now into the hundreds of volunteer run wow collection day events and this is where volunteers on the ground and we encourage people to take the initiative they take the initiative and they organize an event at their local parish hall or um, their local history society rent out a space in the local library and they host a collection day there so essentially anybody could take this model and they could run with it the only thing we would ask of course is that at the end of your collection day once you've gathered all your material using the model that we provided and the materials that we provide for free and um, that you would please think of us and please submit all that wonderful material that you've gathered and send it to us and upload it through our website because we'd very much like to at the very least you can keep it for your own purposes but we would like to have copies of it because the whole aim of the exercise is to have one central archive which we have created that you can upload it to. 
Yeah, and, and yeah, of course. <laughs> that is the uh, the uh, the always the ask, right? Just, it's, it, it's it's you yes. know it's community based, but you know just help us out a little bit. Give us what you got. Um, and again, I I've said this I don't know how many times on the channel, as my regular viewers know, but I'm a big proponent of digital things. That's what I do. I don't nothing that I really do is on paper. <laughs> like everything I do is digital. So obviously, I'm a big fan of this, and and community driven initiatives is something I'm I'm a big fan of. Um, so it's great to hear. Um, I've linked again below. Uh, just I wanted to talk about, speaking of the digital initiatives, I just want to talk about the internet collections. That can be done at any time because I think we have one of our viewers, uh, where do you go? Uh, Darren said he already, oh, sorry, yeah, Darren uh, said he mentioned he's already put some in. So is, right. that, is it on the uh, on the website? Is it explained? Is it easy to use? Yeah, so I think I think Dar Darren is uh, one of our favorite contributors. Um, um, hi, Darren, uh, and thanks very much for tuning in. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to hear from you. Uh, Darren is um, I, I, it's kind of a, a funny exchange I had with Darren. I, I invited him to become a volunteer in the project, and Darren was very modest about it. And, and I turned to him and I said, well, Darren, you, you're effectively already a volunteer anyway. You've contributed <laughs> all this stuff and whatnot right. and really um people like darren have been uh, fantastic um from the very beginnings of the project in bringing forward stories from many quarters uploading images and items and essentially this this material is being uploaded to our so our our, our submission portal is live um for all to use and but the thing about it is that it will not people will, will not be able to view it they, it will not be released to the public until June 2024, when the online archive is made live, and it's it's a free to use archive, and everything that um, is uploaded to us within reason, there obviously will be uh, you know we'll have we'll have to use a little bit of editorial control for certain sensitive material yeah. if and when that is submitted. So we do have certain guidelines around that, and we do have certain sensitivities about what okay. we. So there's a there will be a certain amount of curation, like any archive. This is an archive that has to be curated, but essentially 99.9% .9 of what's been uploaded is going to be released to the general public in a free to use format, and that will be uh, that will be done on 6th of June 2024, the D-Day anniversary. That, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a yeah. really date. Um, yeah, that's great to hear. I, I, well, you you kind of touched on it, um, and and Richard is watching. Um, I just kind of want to expand upon that a little bit um, because as we all kind of are now learning, the digital world is constantly shifting. Things are not always the same. Is is the plan, again, touching on that future-proof piece, is it just going to be through, say, that given website is how it's going to be available once it's published? Is, is that the idea to keep this kind of going for perpetuity? Yeah, well, we do have ambitions. It's all obviously a lot of it will be dependent on funding. Well, we do have ambitions right. to... Um, if we are successful in the United Kingdom, this is something that we can take um, right throughout the world. Um, we could potentially, like, I mean, we're already looking at the Republic of Ireland, where I'm from. You probably gathered from my accent that I'm not actually from the United Kingdom. I'm from uh, from just outside of, it's much of a muchness really, but I'm from, uh, I'm from a neighboring country called Ireland. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we share a land border and everything. And um, I, we have ambitions to, because Ireland is adjacent to the country, and because Ireland, as as people are now are now aware, is, is so intimately linked with the United Kingdom's war effort during the Second World War, in spite of its neutrality, mm -hmm. um, our, we we have the intention to take this to the Republic of Ireland as well. So we will hopefully, um, based on the success of this particular project in the UK, be taking it beyond the borders of the UK. We hope to bring it to Europe. Um, Perhaps even the United States and Canada, and uh, to Australasia, to uh, to Australia, New Zealand, and to any country that would be willing to use this particular model to crowdsource its own heritage around the Second World War. Now, obviously, we are aware that uh, there will be certain sensitivities regarding the recording of the heritage of, let's say, right. Nazi Germany during the Second World War, or Imperial Japan, and indeed, in the context of the current conflict, uh, the you know the the amazing history of the soviet union during the mm -hmm. second world war and the contribution that soviet citizens whether they be ukrainians russians belarusians and um, people of the central asian nations and um and the far east uh, played serving in the soviet armed forces and the contribution they made to allied victory 
And um, obviously, this is a very sensitive topic. We don't know whether we'll ever be able to do that, but we certainly have the aspiration to take it that far. The, pro the idea behind this project is beginning of the UK, we eventually, our, our goal is really hopefully to take it to as many countries beyond the UK as possible. And, you know, it would be a dream come true if we could make it global. But in terms of answering Richard's question around future proving the archive, future proving the, ar proofing the archive is really dependent as is the construction of the archive currently. It's right. dependent upon public support. Right. What keeps this archive alive, because it is a digital archive, is public interest and support and the willingness of the public to continue contributing, perhaps long after the project actually officially um, concludes okay. in July 2024. If we can keep it if we can keep it running, if we can keep it open to the public, they can keep submitting. But it is contingent on two things: public interest, and of course, in the, this is a funded project, so funding is obviously a very important part of the creation of a digital archive and uh, for a crowdsourcing initiative such as this. But more than anything, it is really dependent on the interest and support of members of the public. This is the whole point of crowdsourcing. What right. is created, what is created is something that is created by collective mass and not just a team of individuals such as we are based at Oxford. Um, we can accomplish nothing without uh, the people's support and we are getting a huge amount of support um, from many quarters, from people like Darren, from people like Richard O'Sullivan, um, who are um, viewing this at the moment, and they've been they've been incredibly supportive of this endeavor, and it is really the support of people like people like that, people who have actually, in in, in some cases, have been doing this much longer than we have, right. um, and who have their own experience and their own expertise at doing crowdsourcing initiatives. Um, it is their support and their advice and their help in getting the word out there that will keep this endeavor alive as long as possible. And that's how this archive will be feature proofed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, again, my experience with these things and working with, you know, the more traditional brick and mortar paper archives, it's, it, it, it that has its place, but I think also digital has its place in, in that sense, right? That it, it requires community buy-in and, and all of that. And I guess when we're talking about this one, we're talking worldwide, because again, I just want to, confirm because because Andreas is in Germany um, he, anyone from anywhere with any sort of you know connection to this worldwide conflict can contribute yes initially Andreas initially our goal was really to record the story of the United Kingdom during the Second World War and then uh, you know as the uh, idea was developed it was decided that really because the UK was very closely in linked with a wider Commonwealth war effort, i.e. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, the Dominion, and also, um, this, in spite of their neutrality, also the what was then known as the Irish Free State or, um, or um, uh, basically Southern Ireland, um, independent Ireland. Um, it, they, this Commonwealth contribution was linked in with a UK contribution. So the idea was a UK and Commonwealth war effort, and that was what we would focus on. But we have since come to understand that there is a wide ranging interest beyond the UK shores in um, seeing uh, people's stories recorded and community stories recorded. So we're actually open to taking stories from any quarter. We will take, we will accept stories. Um, from Germany. We will accept stories from Austria, Italy. We will accept stories from wherever they come from. We will not turn any stories away unless, unless they're obscene or, you know, in a format that we cannot record. We will take stories from any quarter because this is all part of the, that. That, that has been um, our goal from the very beginning and that is the decision we've made. In fact, actually a couple of weeks ago, um, I recorded um, a, an interview with a 102-year-old Brazilian veteran of the Second wow. World War, a, me a member of the right. first Brazilian expeditionary yeah. uh, division who uh, fought at the Mo Battle of Monte uh, Castello. And um, I recorded the interview on the anniversary of the Battle of Monte Castello a couple of weeks ago with this veteran. And he gave his interview in Brazilian with his grandson as a translator. And um, that's not at all connected with the UK and Commonwealth War <laughs> effort, but we still took that story. My God, we did. Oh, yeah. Um, because because you can't because we're at a stage where we can't afford to pass up the opportunities like that. So, um, 
any story that's relevant to the Second World War, any story that's relevant to any particular side, to any particular experience, Holocaust histories, it's very important that we record um, the remaining, the stories of the remaining survivors and eyewitnesses of the Holocaust. It's incredibly because they are getting fewer and fewer as every day goes mm. by. And this is this is an episode in history um, which is often separated from the Second World War, but it is very much a part of the story of the Second World War that um, people must not be allowed to forget. And the best way we can remember the Holocaust is to record the story so people can attach um, mem me the, the concept of memory to the stories of eyewitnesses and to the, to the evidence that this event took place. And it's the same with any other comparable story um, which took place during the Second World War. Um, we are open to any and all stories. And if you would like to submit a story to us, we will gladly take it. Great. Yeah, I just, sorry, yeah, the, uh, the the Brazilian thing clicked because I remember seeing that. And yeah, that was amazing um, that that is a, such a small force to begin with. And then to get that story on the date, I mean, that's... Uh, that's obviously something I love doing because that's, you know, literally the name of the channel. Um, so yeah, that, that's great. Um, so you mentioned, I'm just going to go back again, kind of to your opening remarks there, uh, because this is available on the website, but I just want to clear up again, because um, again, I think transparency is also helpful in terms of, you know, getting buy-in from people, not necessarily literally monetary, you know, monetary buy-in, but the question about who, how this project is being funded. Okay. That's an easy question to answer. We are entirely funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And uh, the um, the amount that we're funded to is, um, I, can't, I, I can't give an exact figure. Um, it's it's a fairly large um, amount of money. It's, um, it's in the hundreds of thousands. And it's um, the, 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 the funding, I can tell you what the funding is used for. Um, the funding is primarily support major events right a major digital collection day events it supports media operations it supports getting you know sort of publicity getting getting the word out there but it, it is primarily targeted at funding major digital collection day events whatever is required to support these events whether it be venue hire whether it be if in the case of a major event where we decide to go for a festival kind of model approach, right. um, you know, where reenactors are hired, um, essentially where we invite speakers, guest speakers to come and to essentially act, you know, at a number of speaking events, you know, alongside the, you know, it, it, to give a bit of variety, things yeah. like that. We have funding available for that to facilitate educational activities on the day um for young and old and um i can give you an example of this um yes, i please. um before i joined the project team many years before i joined this project i was actually part of the european 1914 1918 project in the republic of ireland i was a volunteer at an event called um ireland during the first world war which was held at trinity college dublin where i was then a student it was a collaboration between the National Library of Ireland and Trinity College and the state broadcaster RTE. And essentially what happened at that event, it was an amazing event. Um, we essentially ran a digital collection day. It was a huge amount of funding was put into it. Um, it was a very considerably large event. We had a lot of attendees with the amount of people who turned out with objects and items and stories were in definitely in the hundreds and we had a large attendance at public talks which were recorded by the state broadcaster and later broadcast mm -hmm. on radio you know, had television coverage and there were reenactors on the front square of trinity college and you had even a sort of an all-male kind of choir singing ditties from the first world war <laughs> uh, such as smile 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 long way to tipperary yeah. and so on and so forth and in the context of the Republic of Ireland, um, it's very important to note that in the Republic of Ireland, the, re the First World War, memory of the First World War was sort of taboo for a long time because right. of the nature of Irish nationalist history. Obviously, um, uh, upon Ireland's independence in 1922, it had just come out of a decade of war and revolution, uh, beginning really with uh, the Ulster Home Rule crisis, the mobilization of volunteer movements, both on the unionist side and on the nationalist side, and then 
both sides effectively went to war with the British in the British Army. They uh, it was a, four, a long four-year grueling war for many countries, but undoubtedly the country that one of the countries that was affected the worst throughout the British Empire was Ireland because yeah. society emerged very battered, bruised, and tattered. And there was a general election which brought to power a party which looked for Republican separatism and a very violent, heart-rendering um, revolutionary struggle unfolded, which ultimately resulted in a treaty between Britain and Ireland and our independence. And when we came out of that particular period, uh, the memory of the First World War became overshadowed by the wider national struggle that had taken place to secure independence from the United Kingdom. And so while the memory of the First World War persisted, openly speaking about the experience that Ireland had in the First World War became less and less acceptable. And as the 20th century progressed, it became buried and shrouded and forgotten. And it was only in the latter decades, particularly the 1990s, that the memory of the First World War in Ireland and Ireland's experience in this conflict began to be resurrected and people began to discuss it openly. And you still had some Irish veterans of the war there left. And it took 20 to 30 years, really, for people in the Republic of Ireland to have a conversation about this and to have a conversation about the role that Ireland's experience in the war played in the creation of the Irish state and the journey that we went on, something that we had never really openly discussed. And the holding of this event in Trinity College Dublin, this Collection Day event, was part of that process, a kind of a healing, if you will. Mm. And people were invited to come forward and share their stories. And so it produced this great breakthrough moment, which was a moment of um, profound change in terms of the cultural memory of Ireland's past. And that is really the utility of events like this. Yeah. This is the potential that they have to generate a conversation about the importance of events such as the Second World War to the formation of a sort of a, a, a nation state or a national identity. And in the case of the United Kingdom, the Second World War is pivotal in creating modern Britain because out of the ashes of the Second World War comes a massive rebuilding program and several institutions that are created in this country which are treasured by the British people, such as the National Health Service, uh, and various different other attributes of what we now call the welfare state, they come out of the reforms that are introduced at the end of the Second World War. And th this is the quid pro quo. This is what's promised by the British government to the people of Britain as their quid pro quo for their service in the Second World War. And so when we look at modern Britain today, it's because of the Second World War that we have the country that exists today. And this event and events like it in this project is about reminding people how we came to this particular point in our time and, and, and basically how modern Britain came about and more importantly, the role that your forebears play, played in the creation of this country and what they sacrificed and fought and uh, experienced during this war. This is, this is what we're looking to preserve. Yeah, that, that's a, that was going to be one of my later questions, but yeah, that's great that you went there anyway. It's it's greater to uh, to understand the bigger uh, picture because often I try to do that with my own work when I'm just literally just talking to people. It's not always about, you know, say that specific, specific event or whatever. I'm trying to say maybe teach a bigger lesson or start a bigger conversation. So I'm great. That's great to hear that that's what's going on behind all of this. That That's great to hear. And then that's kind of what you and the team kind of are thinking about is great. Um, just quickly before I forget, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned other events and, and sending things to that. Is there any other events like uh, like the We Have Ways? I think it's called We Have Ways Fest now. I think they changed the name. Are, are you connected with them? Are you doing anything through that? Yes. Yes, well, we are, um, for the moment, our connection with We Have Ways. Now, We Have Ways, James Holland and Al Murray are both aware and I think in their own ways um, supportive of what we're doing. Uh, for the moment, our connection with We Have Ways is, um, and with, um, with, the, with the, two, the, two, the two captains who lead it up, um, our connection with them is that we have um, two, we're, we're doing two promotional events. We're doing Chalk Valley History Festival Perfect. and uh, We Have Ways Fest. So we're going to have a presence at both those festivals. 
Now, it's not looking like a collection day events will be held. It would be great if they were, but for the moment, we're just looking right. to promote promote the project at those events, and we're in discussions with the organizers of those events. So we should have a presence on the ground. Um, we are also looking to have a presence at other history festivals, even smaller history festivals, you know, and, and local fates uh, throughout the United Kingdom in order to promote the project. So we're looking at the big level and we're also looking at the macro level, the smaller local level as well. Um, local engagement is particularly important because we're finding that quite a lot of engagement is coming to us um, through direct contact with people. And so that's a very important part of promoting our project. But yes, um, the We of Ways movement, uh, followers of the We of Ways movement, members of the independent company um, are, are, are increasingly aware of what we're doing. Good. And uh, the impression certainly that I'm getting as somebody who's a We of Ways follower myself and a regular listener is uh, that it is, a, um, it is something that is growing uh, of increasing interest among the We of Ways community. And, uh, we hope for and indeed invite um, the whole of the We Ways community um, to partake in the project in any way they see fit. Um, um, we're looking to borrow an army, really, to uh, <laughs> to, uh, to to help us make this happen. Because yeah. really, in terms of we we need in terms of volunteers and what we call participants, and I'll explain those two terms to you. Uh, at a later point, um, um, we need we need people to step forward, be prepared to give up their time, and we're aware that people's time is precious. But we're asking you if you're mm. interested, and if you're willing to contribute to something that is a very worthwhile cause, please do either volunteer with us to help us out at our our collection days, or help us out in some other capacity, or be a participant, contribute something to our project, contribute a memory, a story, an item. Um, help us preserve um, the, the public heritage of the Second World War by giving something of what you may may have, no matter how small. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, Darren's uh, looking forward to uh, to meeting up. Yeah, I think we have a few of the uh, independent company who, who follow me as well. So uh, I was going to say, you're looking for an army, I can contribute probably. Yeah, the army a section, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm following that's growing, but it's it's good just to get the word out as much as possible. Um, yeah. I learn every day, um, so it, so it's amazing. Um, yeah, so you mentioned there kind of the roles. I do want to ask maybe not necessarily, hopefully, not too much of a difficult question, but I think it's an important question again in terms of uh transparency. Um, from the Great Dominion, another follower of my channel, uh, and lots of support there. Um, authenticity obviously is going to come up, uh, and I understand it's it's a digital collection, so it's just not like, hey, we have this thing, and you know we're going to take it into a collection necessarily. But there's still going to be some sort of vetting, right, when it gets published. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about that? Is it still too early? Um, anything around that would be would be great. Yeah, well, I mean, there are actually pr pretty much everybody on our team um, ha has um, an academic um, qualification, a significant okay. academic. We have. Uh, there are four. Uh, it's a team of five, and four of us have uh, doctorates. I myself, um, a, um, I have a PhD in modern Irish and British history, uh, focusing on the Second World War. So I am, um, if you want, if you don't want to call me an expert, I'm somebody who specialised um, <laughs> on an aspect of Second World War history, specifically the role of um, Irish volunteers in the British forces. So I do have um, that qualification. Um, and um, but we're, but outside of our team, we're backed up by a steering group okay. of uh, suitably qualified um, practitioners and academic professionals um, from a range of institutions across the United Kingdom. We have um, we we recently have um, we recently had two additional members join the steering group. We had uh, Dr. Sarah Louise Miller who is a member of Kellogg College, Oxford, and the author of a forthcoming book, uh, The Women Behind the Few, um, which is about basically the role of um, female members of the, of the Women's Royal Air Force and their role in British intelligence during the Second World War. And she is launching her book actually this week at Bletchley Park Museum and will be promoting it right. the following day at our event um, in Oxford, Oxfordshire County Library. Uh, so um, Sarah has, um, uh, you know we're very grateful to her she it's it's been 
uh, very pleasing to us that she has joined um, our steering group and is contributing her expertise, um, particularly given the fact that it's Women's History Month. We also have uh, Dr. Will Butler, um, Head of Military Records at the National Archives. We have Jonathan Fennell of King's College London. Um, we have many uh, very high caliber um, professional historians on our steering group. And they can and will provide um, this particular um, expertise in order to vet the collections and in order to basically examine what we are receiving um, essentially to verify its authenticity and to put the put the stories that we are receiving within a particular context um, with it within a particular time frame um, a chronological time frame of how the war unfolds and also in terms of the thematic significance of what we are receiving right. Uh, so we do have a very, very impressive um, selection of um, top, top academic historians uh, advising us in terms of the coordination of our project and in terms of the kind of submissions that we are receiving from our participants. And also to, um, to provide support in terms of our outputs as well, because in addition to receiving submissions, we are also our role, one of the reasons we're funded is to educate the public. We are producing a great deal of content through our social media channels. We have mm -hmm. a podcast um, and um, we um, have other activities that we have planned. So we're not just going to, we're not, we're not just looking to take um, <laughs> what people are giving us. We're looking right. to give back as well. And we're looking to share what we're receiving. It takes selections of what we are receiving from our archive, what people are submitting and share them with us. When I give you an example, I don't know if you saw the story of the lucky rupee. I don't think so. Um, okay, we, we, uh, about a week or so ago, we posted a story on our social media channels and, and we produced it in video format, a short video format. And it's the submission of a story um, about, it was submitted by a gentleman uh, whose father uh, served in the 14th Army in Burma uh, during the Second World War. And while fighting the Japanese in Burma, um, he was an artilleryman, but a, um, he was shot at by a Japanese sniper. And the Japanese bullet uh, penetrated the breast pocket of his tunic. And in the breast pocket of his tunic were two items, actually three items. I count them all. Um, his Bible, his cigarette case. And it just so happened that there was a rupee coin floating <laughs> uh, in and around the back of the cigarette case. The Japanese bullet penetrated the Bible, went through the cigarette case and was stopped only by that tiny little rupee coin yeah. behind the cigarette case. And according to the person who submitted the story, if the rupee coin had not been there to stop the bullet, uh, the bullet would have entered his father's heart. And that person, that participant who submitted that story, he would not exist. Right. And it's as simple as that. So that yeah. lucky rupee coin was something that his father held on to until his dying day and is a, a keepsake that was handed down um to um his family and uh, we are uh, were we, we were very fortunate to receive both uh, an image a very nice image of the rupee coin and also the story behind it well that's and amazing yeah. that's an example that's an example the, they might be very short snippet stories associated yep. with a very uh, an image of a very very small item but um right. That those 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 images, those items, and the stories behind them, they, they they there are there are almost no words to describe their significance at, at both a personal level and an emotional level. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I guess that's kind of what I think about when I think about this project. In that sense, it, it's those stories. It's not you know, you know, from thirty nine to forty five. It's that one moment in time. Um, it, it, it's great to hear. Um, yeah, because again, we had a question about that. Um, where to go? I keep losing them. James uh, McNeil was talking about how he has stories through his great uncle, through his father, and he's not really convinced of the truth. Um, I have similar stories. <laughs> so I just wanted to, this is, I might not make sense right away. So just kind of let me go with this for a second. But same with my grandfather. He loved telling stories. He was a big storyteller, loved telling stories about all the things he did. And some of them make sense. Some of them make perfect sense. Some of the war ones don't make too much sense. So that's kind of one thing, I guess, is what people in the sidebar and maybe later will be wondering about, right? Is 
people will tell these stories and more worried about maybe those embellishments and things like that. Is that and then the question raised about mythology of war and yeah. how later things like movies can influence actual memories from the war, which happens all the time, right? That was very common, still is. Um, is that another thing? Is that a major concern for you guys? Or is that just something you're going to have to deal with as you move forward? Of course, this is a con well, this is a concern that existed long before the greatest generation, as they're yeah. called in the United States, or the wartime generation, as they're called, I think, in Canada and certainly in the UK. Uh, this is a concern... Um, long before members of that generation started to disappear en masse. Yeah. Um, and there are very few of them left now. Um, there are quite a lot of eyewitnesses who were young during the war, children or you know, adolescents, but we have precious few veterans. Um, and um, that was a concern even um, when we had them, when they were in their 70s and 80s, and you know, when they were, you know, their, their memories were still relatively fresh. And um, when vast majority of them were fairly compass mentis. Um, because that is the problem with time. As time mm -hmm. advances, this is one of the reasons why historians such as James Holland um, have um, commented on yep. um, the, you know, how desirous is, it is when you're constructing a story, when you're writing a book, say, for example, it is better to take uh, first-hand accounts that have been written the day of the battle, you know, in a di in diary format or interviews that were taken, you know, sort of, immediately after the Second World War, you know, sort of in a kind of, you know, a sort of a debrief format or testimonies that were taken by, you know, certain authorities that were put into the field, such as, um, you know, the combat reports, reports that were taken from American uh, paratroopers in Normandy by field teams that were sent in to basically record their, basically like after action reports, uh, their experiences of combat. Um, and it's testimonies like that that give this particular freshness and um, relative lack of bias in terms of what actually happened during those events. Um, and with the events of times, one of the key problems with oral history is the fact that um, people can mis misremember with the passage of time or they can associate their memories with something that they've read and let's say, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, uh, some particular source they could uh, uh, have read. Um, they could have read Little Heart, or they could have read, um, God forbid, they could have read um, an historian who's um, out of out of favor has been um, David Irving, for example, who's yeah. out of favor, <laughs> you know, uh, or they could have read an account which influenced mm -hmm. the shaping of their memory for years to come, or framed their memory in a particular way, or they could have read a regimental biographer. They could yeah. have read, let's say, a history right. of the. Irish Guards Battalions 1, 2, and 3, and essentially they could have, you know, taken these particular accounts of what they, the events they partook in, um, in Belgium and Holland, uh, they may vehemently disagree with the retelling of these accounts because they were actually there, um, but they are, they, they, they might fundamentally disagree, or, but they might also accept readily a fact which was not true that was actually at variance with what they actually remembered and what they experienced right. but because it's an official account they suddenly thought well maybe my recollection is wrong and their recollection or their spin on this is right this is the problem with oral history and the problem with memory and this problem is going to creep in to the next generation's retelling of their forebear story and their grandchildren and so on and this is the problem we have with stories that are brought to us at second relief. It is a problem that will always be there, it'll always exist. And of course, this is one of the reasons why having a certain amount of expert academic oversight from people who are, who have specialized on the subject of the Second World War um, at a macro level, uh, people like Jonathan Fennell, who you know pr produced the first single volume um, history of the British and Commonwealth armies during the Second World War and who used accounts, male censorship reports, yep. containing accounts of people's experiences, these first-hand accounts that were coming straight off and that were been assessed on the basis of millions of letters. You know, what better sources to be relying on as a primary source for such a work? Well, people like this will bring this particular level of oversight to the kind of submissions that we are receiving. And, you know, inaccuracies will inevitably be spotted. They'll be picked up. I'll give you an example. Already an account has been submitted to our project by a woman 
who was on one of the last ships, according to her own testimony, one on one of the last ships out of Singapore before mm. the Japanese took the city. Right. And she was always also an eyewitness to the Blitz and to the Battle of Britain. She remembered the um, she remembered Neville Chamberlain's speech. She was at home in in Oxfordshire uh, when Neville Chamberlain announced um, that the country was at war. Um, and, um, you know, her memory uh, is very vivid of leaving Singapore. But there is a memory that she raised, which could not possibly have happened, uh, which was that she saw the Prince of Wales and the Repulse sunk by the Japanese in Singapore Harbour, which <laughs> did not take place. There's not, but, it, it, but, but the thing about it is, the thing about it is when you receive a story like that and when somebody claims of great veracity that that actually happened, you can understand and you can see that, yes, there's a bit of misremembering going yep. on. I'm not saying embellishment. I'm not going to use the word embellishment because there can be genuine cases, there could be genuine lapses or confusions of detail. Sometimes people can conflate events because yes. of the enormity of the events that they partook and they contend to remember events in connection and even recall events that they actually did not witness, such as, you know, the th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of people who claim they heard Winston Churchill give his famous speech on the radio which they could have only read in newspapers in 1940 and could not have read, heard on the radio uh, yeah. because he didn't give a radio speech. Right. Um, a, a, a radio speech version of what they read in the newspapers. But so many people remembered hearing Churchill um, make that famous speech in, uh, in June 1940, um, you know, rallying the country um, because they misremembered. And that's yeah. an example of it. And you don't act disrespectfully. You just no. understand where it's happening. You make note of it. And it's, a, it's also an interesting point of observance about when memory can become distorted. Right. And it's not something that we can criticize or put our hands up in the air and say, oh, God, it's happening again. We <laughs> just have to understand that this is how memory works. Yep. And when we can flag it and when we can put the context behind it, it's then that we can better understand it. And and you know sort of distinguish what's authentic from what is less so yeah i mean it's it, it's come up and again quick one i think of is uh, for diep obviously it looms large in canada uh, and the memories around that one are shaky at best there was a veteran who landed on the main beach uh, at diep itself and says there was no tanks there <laughs> he was adamant there were none and we know that's just not true um so it's just that's something i i, I like to, to think about in that sense um um, okay, this is actually, yeah, one, and then we'll get to kind of uh, to the wrap-up. This one, I know it's digital, but if, say, somebody comes in with something and they don't want to hold it any longer, do you have, like, recommendations? Do you have, are you working with somebody or an organization towards that end? I'm going to, in answer to that question, I'm going to frame it within a wider effort that's going to be happening over the next few years. Okay, there are... Uh, millions of uh, service records been held by the Ministry of Defence, which um, at this moment are, are on a transfer process um, to the National Archives because um, it, it, it will be obligatory for, for the purposes of releasing these records to the general public for their use. Uh, it will be uh, necessary to do this. And, uh, you know, in, in undertaking this, um, the National Archives and the uh, Ministry of Defence have to take on board, and I'm I'm speaking about this process as an outsider now, but I'm I'm just I'm commenting from the vantage point of a certain amount of insight that they have to they had to take on board or have to take on board the consideration as all um, curators of archives and museums they have to take on board the consideration that these objects are not going to last forever, whether it be right. ten years, twenty years, fifty years, a century couple of centuries or several centuries, there will be wear and tear. These objects will degrade the paper upon which uh, these the, the, these um, this data is recorded is going to degrade as well. It's going to rot away. It's going to crumble. Um, and the only way to preserve it is to make copies or to yeah. digitize. And essentially, that is the determination that they make. And I think uh, my understanding is that there would be a dual approach. You preserve the physical record for as long as it is possible to do so, 
but for the purposes of ensuring the physical record lasts for as long as possible, you make a digital copy. So digitization, digitization is the surest method to make sure that an object or a record is preserved for posterity without that object having to be revisited or touched or worn or torn right. or, or and eventually hastened towards destruction over time. You make a copy, you make a copy, you make an image so that you don't need to keep revisiting that ob object or document all the time that you can, it's obviously great to hold it in your hand right. or to look at it yourself. It's always great to do that. You, it's it's like going to an art gallery. There's nothing better than looking at the original rather than right. a copy. But by creating a copy, you help preserve the original. And that is the point of digitization. And also the second point of digitization is to give wider access exactly. so that multiple copies can be distributed. And by and it's not really possible for our project, um, in answer to your question, to enable right. the permanent preservation of all these documents, books, accounts, letters, photographs, objects. We can't do that. Museums can, um, public public institutions can, where they have space. And bear in mind, for a lot of these institutions, space is at a premium and they can't take everything. No. We hope and trust that nobody in their right mind will take you know, an object which they might consider otherwise to be valueless and take it out and throw it into a skip or into a bin um, or you know send it to landfill or put it into an incinerator uh, when they feel it's no, no longer in use. We hope that that object will continue to be something that will be passed down from generation to generation within that family and will be kept because that is how physical material history has always been preserved. Yep. What digitization does is it guarantees it, it or attempts to guarantee that an image of that object or a description of that object will always be there and will always be shared and the more off and when, once it's done once it's digitized and once it's shared that ensures that object uh, or that documents or that photographs ultimate survival and it i i just want to say it's the same for recorded testimony as well. It's the same for testimony recorded by video, um, and it's the same for uh, sound recordings as well. It's the same for oral history. Um, that is how we preserve a story. That is how we prever preserve somebody's voice and the emotion in somebody's voice and the veracity of their story. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, preaching on the choir with me, <laughs> yeah. as it were. Um, uh, obviously, yeah. So it's just, I, I understand completely it is. And the, and the space thing, I think, keeps, Something is important to remember. I know this is not what you guys are doing, but that's an important thing I think gets easily forgotten. Like I live in Canada, I live in Ottawa. We got nothing but space, but we still don't have room for everything, right? You got to put a wall. You got to stop the size of the building somewhere. So it's it's something that I think gets forgotten. So having what you just said, I think sums it up perfectly. Having those digital linkages, I guess, is the best way to say it. That's accessible for everyone once the project has reached its you know completion, so to speak. Um, is amazing and, and then something obviously that I'm, I'm very interested in um, and you said you wanted to we can end up with you want to talk about the different roles and what people can do to help if yeah you, you want to talk about well one thing I wanted to say just very quickly is that yeah. um, with regard to um, pre preserving documents yep. photographs objects with regard to personal submissions there may come a time in the future where a service record when it's released I'm not sure how that would work with the United States because a great amount of their service records were unfortunately destroyed in 1973 at a warehouse fire in St. Louis, which uh, I think a lot of historians such as myself still agonize about to this day. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, in, in countries like Canada, Australia, uh, the UK, um, a lot of service records um, from the Second World War um, are, exist and they're, they're stored correctly and they will be digitized in time. Uh, the great opportunity that... W w that a service record is a very simple document. It is really, a, you, you know, basically it could be one or two pages and it just conveys a certain amount of very basic information at the top. Plus, a, you know, off, very often a handwritten record of um, the serviceman or woman's track record of service throughout the war until uh, their demobilization. So it's very often a simple document. But that document often contains quite a lot of very interesting information, which if you combine it with an entire collection and you're able to mine it for data, mm -hmm. produces fascinating results. 
But an even more fascinating potential result is the ability to digitize that document, to preserve the data within it and you know, essentially itemize it in a tab beside it. And then at some future point, a crowdsourcing project such as their finest hour or other crowdsourcing efforts can be linked to that document yeah. and a submission of that serviceman's record. It could be a famous serviceman like Paddy Main or yeah. Brendan Paddy Finucane or, or, you know, or Douglas Bader. It could be, you know, all that information that has been accrued about their life would be attached to that service record and that can be entered in. But if we were to, if we were to get to a point where we're able to build profiles of people, we wouldn't be able to do it for everybody because some were lost and we have no idea who they were. Yeah. But for those who we do have information for, where we have an oral history testimony that was recorded by the Imperial War Museum, where we had a submission to their finest hour project, where we have a record in the National Archives or something else, we can link that once those service records come online in let's say 20 years time, we can link all that information to that particular person's service record and so build up as close to a complete a profile of who they were not just their service but who they were as, as people and what they looked like if they have a photograph and what their voice sounded like and what other things they got up to that is not mentioned in their service record basically essentially the service record is the paint by number and everything else we're able to attach to it that's the color that is where i see crowdsourcing efforts going in the future and my god that would be exciting oh yeah that would be i mean that's the historian dream right of all of it's like yeah, a web, right i think in my head right yeah. people have literally done that with resources for their own say dissertation i know people who when i was doing mine did that and it was like a web and they could just click on it and go blah 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 with different software so having that as a national open resource i mean that's just that's the ultimate <laughs> but yeah that, that's great so um yeah i completely agree and i think that would be i mean the the uh the ultimate goal. Um, I just did want to say because Scott is one of our uh, our basically resident archivist in the United States. <laughs> yes, the fire was bad, but some did survive, and Scott would know. Yeah, he's an archivist. He knows this stuff. So, yes, thank you very much, Scott, for that contribution. Yeah, it's. Um, I suppose um, where where I became aware of it was where I was looking at um, uh, looking at First World War. Um, you know, doughboy records, and yeah. quite a lot of those I think were destroyed. But I believe also quite a lot of Second World War records were destroyed. But as you pointed out, some did survive. I think, I think it's, I think quite a lot of people are in the dark about the extent of that destruction and what actually survived. So, thank you very much for raising that particular point. It's good to know. Um, it's good to know that some stuff did survive, indeed. Yeah. And, and also, it must, it must be pointed out that. Um, you know, a similar event happened in the uh, in the in the UK as well. In 1940, as a result of uh, the German Blitz in the Second World War, 80% uh, of the First World War records, First World War service records, yeah. in what was then known as the Public Records Office, in, which was then located in Central Office and later became the National Archives, which is now located down the road from me in Kew, in uh, West London. Um, that that took a direct hit. That wing of the building which held the First World War service records took a direct hit, and those records were obliterated and burnt. And uh, curiously, the bulk of the records that survived um, were officer records plus a certain amount, maybe about four hundred thousand uh, ordinary ranks, uh, including Sam Mendes' grandfather, I believe. Right. Uh, his, yeah. his his grandfather's service records survived. Um, as well, but um, quite a lot were destroyed, including quite a lot of Irish uh, servicemen's um, service records. Which is, so that's why I suppose I'm so damn frustrated <laughs> when it comes to First World War service records because virtually none exist uh, yeah. for Irish service personnel in either the U.S. forces or the British forces, and that's terribly frustrating. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to point out the distinctions between two different categories of participant within our yes, project yes uh, so a vo our volunteers are people who we train and we have over 100 of them now uh, but we're looking to expand as i say that army um you know it'd be nice if we could add add an independent company to their strength but uh <laughs> but uh no anyway it, it might be wishful thinking and uh, that is not up to us and um, we can only put the invitation out there but uh the thing is that we are looking for as many people to come forward as possible because we do need people to come out and help at these events and indeed uh, being a volunteer doesn't mean you become like a foot soldier working at one of these events being a volunteer 
means you can actually volunteer to run your own event right. and organize other and train uh, help train up other volunteers that you will help coordinate or lead to run an event in your local area and we want people to do as many as these volunteer run events as they can and do a widespread throughout the uk my objective our objective is for this to become viral and we want this we want we want everybody to be doing it. we want ideally every parish hall in the entire united kingdom to be running an event and to suck up as much public heritage in their local area as people are willing to contribute mm -hmm. because this is all voluntary at the end of the day the same people who are giving up their time you know it's the same for participants um you know when we invite a participant to contribute a story they may not want to do that they may want to keep right. that story to themselves it might it might link in with something that's painful for them, something that's personal for mm -hmm. them. And it might be that they may not want to throw a story that they hold very dear into this wide public archive right. for any Tom, Dick and Harry to see. We can understand that and we can appreciate that. Yep. All I would say is that the people who are contributing to this project, who are volunteering to this project, um, from our judgment, seem to be very good hearted people very genuine honest people who have a genuine passion which is what we share of trying to understand and learn more about the second world war and the you know the hopes joys fears sacrifices mm -hmm. that that wartime generation throughout in britain and throughout the world uh, made uh, you know to achieve um peace victory and security um and you know that's the volunteer side of things you know so our participants are equally important so the volunteers are the ones that make the events happen the participants are the people who come to us who submit stories to their on, to our online archive and who attend the digital collection day events and we need the participation of both those groups of people um in any capacity they see say see fit mm -hmm. um uh, because that is really what crowdsourcing is all about and that uh, and it's those two types of people those two groups of people that will actually make this happen in the end yep um yeah completely agree uh, that's how it's gonna have to be uh for something this large like you said yeah that's how by uh, you know making it viral that's how it works <laughs> that's literally what that means so it, it, it's great to hear that um sorry just one quick question i thought just right now um because i was just thinking about my own family history my i'm by based on my last name i'm sure people have guessed i am french canadian on one side um is this going to be just for English or can people, uh, you know, put in in different languages? Is that a possibility or is it English only? It's a good question. I think, I think submissions could be taken in another language and then translated. Ideally, we would like somebody to do a translation themselves, but actually right. where it might be better if somebody wishes to make it like, I mean, primarily officially, um, you know the, we accept the submissions in english right. um but where somebody feels a need to make a submission and they would like to as long as they as long as they're able to understand when they click on share your story on our website right. um that the form the the port the portal form and um, for the direct upload uh will all be written out in english as long as they're able to understand the key questions and uh, they can um you know submit uh, the uh their, their stories or make their submissions in potentially any language they like but right. the thing about it is it needs to be understood that you know a translation might be necessary it, it i think in some cases it might be better if they enter it into in the essentially into the entry bar in their original language so that we can do the translation because that might be better it might be better for us to facilitate a proper translation and uh but they think ideally we would like the stories to be submitted in English. But where if where somebody wants to, you know, make sure that there are no mistakes and no ambiguities about right. that, it's probably better to submit it in the original language and then enable the translation. Uh, it was one of the difficulties I encountered when I interviewed um Oswaldo Saragiotto, um, the Brazilian mm -hmm. veteran I was telling you about earlier. Yeah. Um, his uh, grandson was doing the translation, and you know, again, another problem recording this kind of history is that so much can inevitably be lost in yeah, translation. Exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah, a, a, officially, really, the language is English, but unofficially, we will take a submission in another language if we have to. Um, the uh, the other thing I should probably say is yeah. that um. You know we're not closed um again just to re-emphasize we're not closed off 
to anybody from any corner of the world who has a relevant story yeah. about the war and we will we will do our best to accept what we can yeah i mean yeah that's kind of why i thought of that question because we can you can say that right we'll take anybody but some people still be like oh i don't know until they're like say their specific situation is brought up and discussed because uh, I've, I've just dealt that with myself so i just wanted to make sure that the language thing was brought up and cleared up and i think it's it's great explanation yeah so i don't think we have any questions or anything we missed it's uh it, it seems like uh we've got lots of people who are excited about this and we'll hopefully get some submissions or volunteer um if you need a canadian with some academic training i might know a guy <laughs> if you need some yeah. help over here um yeah well one thing i would say is that um you in canada you are the commonwealth um and um you know like 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 your Australian, New Zealand, and South African counterparts, uh, indeed uh, people from many other countries that were connected with uh, what used to be known as the British world, including my own country, we were connected with it too. Um, um, the thing is that um, you are particularly, you are especially welcome um, in Canada to submit stories to our archive. We'd love to have them. Um, and particularly, I guess, if it, it, it would be particular of particular interest to us if you're able to you know perhaps link those stories to a story of service in in the united kingdom right. if, if you are if you have a story from a member of the canadian expeditionary uh, forces that were sent to the united kingdom either in the royal air force the royal canadian navy and also the uh the um the the army as well the canadian army uh, who were stationed in Britain and, you know, who were, you know, before maybe been moved on to either France or Italy um, or stationed somewhere else during the war. If at some point you pass through the UK, we were particularly keen to uh, get that story. So, and it's the same for United States Armed Forces as well, where we're, we have a particular emphasis where this is where we're open to stories from outside the UK with a particular emphasis on stories of people who were stationed in the UK, who were sent to the UK for their training, either Northern Ireland or any other part of the UK um, for their training prior to deployment overseas on the continent of Europe or elsewhere. Yeah, so yeah, that, I think that, that sums it up pretty well. I figured that's kind of what you guys were aiming for. So it's, it's good to hear that out loud. So yeah, so like I said earlier, everything's linked down below. Check it out, um, your different uh, social media outlets. I'll make sure I get them all on there. Um, but the website is already linked. I know that for sure. Um, so if anyone's interested, just check it out poke around and uh, see what you can do if you can help. Thank you very much. Okay, so thanks for uh, for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. And being able to talk about a project like this gets me excited. So I'm glad to be able to do this in the middle of my day. But it's uh, <laughs> it's great to be able to have it. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching and coming out. And if you can support the project, please do. So uh, other than that, not much else to talk about right now. So I'll see everybody uh, on the next live stream. And I'll let you guys know when that's coming up. So I'll see everybody later. Bye, everyone. Bye.